Edward Mosley was born on November 17, 1923, and resided with his father, mother, and brother, William, in the Bronx, New York. As the son of an immigrant egg farmer, Edward was thrown into the family business from an early age and would handle shipments alongside his father. Later throughout his high school years, his academic achievements were on par with those he had in varsity football, being told that he could do anything but eat the football. Then, on the morning of December 7th, 1941, things would change forever. December 7th, 1941, a state of war. A date which will live in infamy. Like so many others, Edward answered the draft on April 22, 1943, and would begin his basic training as an MP in the States, learning how to handle pistols, rifles, and carbines, as well as operate most non-combat vehicles. In September of that same year, he was shipped to England where much more dynamic training awaited him and his fellow servicemen. Edward was then sent to Ireland and completed his training in April of 1944, being assigned to the 9th Infantry Division for his display of proficiency. With a smile, he even recalls unknowingly standing next to General Eisenhower at one point. The early hours of June 6, 1944 would mark the beginning of the end as more than 150,000 Allied soldiers boarded ships and set course for the occupied French coast of Normandy. Among the thousands was a 20-year-old Edward Mosley, who was his unit's squad leader and assigned to take Omaha Beach. Thirty-four thousand men were loaded into landing crafts and sent towards the beaches as artillery and gunfire made life a living hell. Yet as they neared the coast, a current swept his Higgins boat away from the intended beachhead and towards the cliffs of Point du Hoc. Disoriented by the chaos, Edward and his men scrambled to avoid the spray of bullets as fellow soldiers were shot to his left and right. It was a death trap, he said. You can't get the fear, the loneliness, and the stink when guys are blown up and their guts are hanging out. Although the battle would prove decisive for the Allies, the staggering amount of lives lost would deal tremendous blow to those who survived. Edward would never forget that day and the horrors it brought, nor does he forget the men who fell under his command. Fierce fighting only continued as the arrival of German infantry and armored divisions resisted the inland onslaught of American forces. The region's hedgerows gave German troops ideal cover and were a serious problem for Edward and many others like him. 
making the push forward tedious and bloody. Heavy artillery would continuously batter them as they advanced further. Tanks were later fitted with reworked hedgehog blockades to cut through the denser hedges. Small skirmishes were the forefront of Operation Cobra as town after town was gradually liberated. Edward and the 9th Infantry Division took part in many battles during the breakout from Normandy, including the liberation of the Cherbourg Peninsula. Passing through the towns of Carentan and St. Lo, he mentioned seeing pole fields known as Rommelschwage to damage Allied gliders, and would fashion a scarf from the silky fabric of an American parachute. Civilians of these liberated French towns were more than thankful that the GIs had freed them from occupation, welcoming them with open arms and lots of gratitude. Fond memories were made in France, as he recalls, especially when it came to their hospitality. On one occasion, Edward met a German who had lived in the States as his father worked for Siemens. But, as a Volksdeutsche, he was called back to serve Nazi Germany. When the GIs reached Aachen, the combined efforts of the 9th Infantry Division and several other divisions were required to overcome the German defenders. The urban warfare provided by its large, multi-level buildings meant that squads had to clear each floor before they could move on to the next. House-to-house -house combat was intense, as some fanatic soldiers fought to the very end and took the lives of many others before they were taken out themselves. Edward remembers how some Germans threw Christmas ornaments when they were low on ammunition, and that he later feared being poisoned after contracting measles because he helped himself to some jarred pickles in a basement. Yet as the Americans swept through the streets, no defense could withstand the onward push and the Germans were driven out of the city.
Aachen was the first of many German cities to fall under Allied occupation, though it was far from the last that the 9th Infantry Division would liberate. Ahead of them now lay the Hurtgen Forest, a vast area of impassable, forested terrain that would go down in infamy as an American meat grinder. The 9th Infantry Division was tasked to capture the town of Duren. Yet what they faced was an enemy who had dug themselves in, and required thorough bombardment on their position. As expected, the dense forest and extensive minefields made all progress come at a cost, leaving the GIs unsure whether they would live to see the next day or not. In the Hurtgen Forest, Edward would suffer his only injury of the war, which occurred when branches blown off by artillery landed on his body. When further resistance from the Germans seemed futile, elements of Kampfgruppe Piper, led by SS Standartenführer Joachim Piper, launched a daring offensive on December 16, 1944, to sever Allied supply chains and retake crucial towns. Although the Allies had steadily pushed the Germans beyond their original borders and were under the impression of an imminent capitulation by Christmas that year, hardly anyone expected a feasible counteroffensive to occur. The immediate thrust into Allied lines occurred not too far from the small Belgian town of Stabolo, where Edward and his men spent their time off duty. Left without his unit and uniform, Edward joined up with the 30th Infantry Division and encountered the Germans as they attempted to overwhelm the occupying GIs. Edward and his fellow soldiers kept the Germans back and defended Stavolo, engaging not only enemy infantry but a massive Tiger II tank as well.
Once the remaining bridges were destroyed, the Germans were left with no other option than to retreat and abandon their equipment. Operation Wacht am Rhein had started strong but lost all momentum due to the inadequate supply chains and fierce Allied resistance. Exhausted from tireless combat, Edward was grateful to have survived yet another day and soon rejoined with the 9th Infantry Division on their advance into Germany. The 9th Infantry Division then moved towards the Rhine in hopes of securing a bridgehead across to push further into Germany. Edward would battle through the streets of Trier and Bonn, fighting once more from house to house. The siege on the city would come to an end on March 9, 1945, but following the liberation, one of Edward's men caught sight of a Catholic priest and began beating him down. Startled by his reaction, he explained that the priest was wearing officer's boots and beneath his robes he wore a German officer's uniform, having assumed this disguise to evade capture. Focus would be directed to the town of Remagen and the Ludendorff Bridge, the last bridge across the Rhine. Following a brief skirmish with its German defenders on March 7, 1945, the bridge fell into American hands and would be protected by an extensive array of anti-aircraft equipment. For 10 days, Edward would witness the Germans throwing every kind of ordnance they had at the bridge to demolish it before more Americans could cross. An additional pontoon bridge was also established between the towns of Remagen and Apple, allowing heavy trucks and tanks to traverse the wide Rhine while military engineers repaired the bridge's damages. On March 17, 1945, the Ludendorff Bridge would collapse. Twenty-eight American engineers would lose their lives. By this time, however, five divisions had already crossed the Rhine and similar bridgeheads had been established by other Allied forces as well. Edward remembers that when the British first crossed the Rhine, he and several others were captured by a group of Germans while out on a reconnaissance mission. Though instead of killing them, the Germans took the uniforms and let them go, leaving them stranded on their own. After returning to Allied lines, he was held at gunpoint by an American and demanded that he prove his identity. Not knowing what to say, Edward sang a traditional soldier's song and gained his trust.
During his time in Germany, Edward would go on to see a German POW camp known as Stalag 12A, where around 15,000 prisoners were held and later liberated in April of 1945. As the war went on, he captured countless German prisoners, one being a downed Luftwaffe pilot whose flight jacket he took. Unfortunately, the jacket was lost before he could send it home, and would never be found again. After seizing Augsburg, the 9th Infantry Division passed through the bombed remains of a Messerschmitt factory. When he received word that his brother William was nearby, Edward and another soldier took a German sidecar motorcycle to track him down. William was part of the 33rd Mechanized Division and had gone on to earn a silver star for taking down a German BF-109 with a 50 cal machine gun. After days of searching and unintentionally liberating German villages, they would come across his division in Wetzlar. After countless months away from his family, Edward felt a needed touch of home to embrace his brother again. Germany's surrender was near in April of 1945. Americans and Germans knew it alike. came to an end, however, Edward and his division found themselves in the city of Marburg, where they would spend the remaining months of their deployment. For the time, they stayed at the Tannenberg Kaserne, while other days were spent joyriding in jeeps all across Germany, or assisting the local civilians with food and water. Not long after, he and many others were allowed to go home. After nearly two years of service, Edward returned to New York, where he was warmly welcomed by his family, his wife, and his newly born daughter. As of today, he is 98 years old.